Okay, so dead loading. The first and most important thing is the wall's self-weight. As you can see here in purple, the wall itself will have a weight from the exterior most uh, face to the interior most face of the wall. You'll need to include that weight in your design. So to give you an idea for um, a metal panel finish, that wall weight could be 14 pounds per square foot, or for a four inch brick finish, that wall weight could be up of around 50 pounds per square foot. So the finishes on the walls can have a big impact. Another thing that you might have to consider is the building loads, your building dead loads. Um, and this will come into play if your connection between your wall framing and your um, building structure uh, does not have allow for differential movement. So this is a case where you might have a structural steel uh, building, columns and beams, and then maybe a uh, concrete filled metal deck. And instead of having allowing for differential movement, like at the mid span, let's say there's a column here and a column here, if you don't allow for that differential movement, then any additional dead load that's put in after the wall is constructed um, could conceivably axially load these wall studs. So it's something that um, you'll need to keep in mind depending on how you uh, design your structures. Um, out here in California, in general, we always um, allow for that differential movement, so we almost never uh, design for the building dead loads and live loads, but um, if, if you do somewhere, then you need to. Um, and this is a little different than load-bearing framing, which where your uh, light gauge framing would be your main support. Uh, that's kind of a whole different topic. The same thing would go for live load. Again, if you don't have that deflection difference uh, here and here, then um, you'd have to design these wall studs for that axial live load. And it can get quite significant um, in your design. So you either want to make a conscious choice to put that gap in or, um, or uh, make sure you include that loading. Okay, the next thing here is our uh, wind loading. So um, ASC 7, Chapter 30 now for components and cladding. And a couple things just to note, um, I'm not going to go through how to calculate your wind. Um, that's probably a whole another seminar in and of itself. But uh, your corner wind pressures uh, can be quite significant. Uh, when your building is less than 60 feet, uh, it's not that big of a deal. But when your uh, building is greater than 60 feet, the corner wind pressures can be significantly higher. Um, I've addressed this both ways in projects. I've done projects where I identify the corner zone and require uh, more stringent framing in those locations. And then I've also done projects where um, I just designed to the higher wind pressure everywhere, figuring that the um, effort it's going to take to, one, for the design and on the construction side, making sure they get everything in the right place, um, warrants just designing for the higher load. Another thing to keep in mind is that the loads decrease with the increased tributary area. So your wall studs could be designed for less load than your um, fasteners need to be designed for. Um, so that's a big thing to keep in mind as you're running through your calcs. You may find your wind pressure for your wall studs and then try to run that through for your connection design. And that would be inaccurate. So you either need to switch to the connector level uh, wind loads based off of the tributary area or um, just design for the higher wind load. On components and cladding, the suction loads typically govern, and the suction loads are constant of the height of the building. So no matter whether you are at the uh, top of a building um, on the top floor, or if you're down at the ground floor, the wind pressure that you're gonna design to is um, almost always gonna be constant. Another thing to keep in mind, there's a separate KZ value for uh, the components and cladding tables. So be careful about that. And uh, this isn't anything new, but um, the parapet loadings can get quite significant. So um, depending on uh, your wind speed and your exposure, you can easily get up to 100 pounds per square foot. Seismic loading. So um, this hasn't changed uh, too much um, in the new AFC 7-10, but again, you're in chapter 13. Um, if you're in seismic design category A, or seismic design category B, other than some certain parapets, you don't have to check for seismic loads. So that uh, pretty much cuts your effort in half, I think. <laughs> the seismic loads tend to be pretty challenging. Um, but uh, for those of us in seismic design categories C, D, E, and F, um, the seismic loads play a big part. The importance factor, uh, if you look at ASC 7-10, section 13.1.3, 
the importance factor for your components and cladding is different from your importance factor for your building. And um, basically you have an IA of 1.5 if the component is um, needed for continuing continued operation um, or could impair continued operation, or um, your ICP is 1.0. So when you're designing a hospital, the building's eye is 1.5, but the components and cladding, um, then it becomes an interpretation of whether you think your exterior walls are required for continued operation as to whether you design for an eye of 1.5 or an eye of 1.0. Um, I've pretty typically designed for an eye of 1.5 for the exterior uh, wall framing, but um, I could see an argument to try to get away with the eye of 1.0.